Um, so as Sean said, my name is Jeff, and I got a chance to talk to some of you. Uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to connect with others uh, one on one a little bit later. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about databases. By a show of hands, who in here has worked with databases before? All right, so quite a few people. Good experiences? Hands up. Bad experiences? All right. <laughs> so it seems like people have had a, a bit of a uh, bit of both. Um, what I'm going to talk about, so databases are a very broad topic, and I can talk about databases for days. So if you're ever interested in talking about databases in general, I'd love to chat. Uh, today I'm going to focus on a very specific problem in the database world. Uh, for context, um, I'm working on a new NoSQL database called Concourse. I don't think any of you all have heard of it. If you have, I'd be amazed um, at my non-existent marketing team um, that's been able to reach you. Uh, Concourse is a new project, uh, relatively new. I've been working on it for a few years now, and it isn't launched, though it's open source, so you can easily go and check it out. Um, it's going to be launching next year, so you'll probably hear more about it then. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about a specific problem uh, that we've, we've encountered in Concourse and kind of a creative way we've solved it. Um, these lessons are applicable to systems in general. So it isn't just something, hopefully, uh, things that I talk about. Hopefully these are things you can use in you know, uh, system level programming in general, and not just if you're building a database, which most people don't do. Um, so what is Concourse, right? I'm not gonna give you a, a sales pitch, but the problem, generally speaking, that Concourse seeks to solve is to provide immediate insight into any stream of operational data without prior setup or configuration. Those are a lot of words there. And I really tried to condense it to, to really get to the meat of it, but I still want to break down the points that are bold. When we talk about immediate insight, no, this means no pre-computation required. The word any is bold. The reason that is bold is because, I mean, this has to be truly ad hoc. One of the things about databases that most frust fr uh, frustrates me is that you have to come up with a schema. You have to know in advance what's important, on what you want to query, and you've got to tell the database, hey, this is important. Do things to make it easy for me to access this, right? We don't want to do that. Operational data, what does that really mean? Well, this means mission critical or business critical data that you cannot afford to lose or you will go out of business. This is the type of data for which you would use asset transactions. And the last part, without prior setup or configuration, this means, again, no schemas, no background jobs, no MapReduce, no, no crime jobs where you say, here's a bunch of data, do some crunching on it, then I'm going to do some analysis over it, right? So this is a lot of stuff uh, that Concourse seeks to do. And typically, databases don't support this, um, because doing so would require databases to guarantee a couple of properties. The first is, is they would have to be real time. And this means that data must be able to be queried as soon as it's stored. They have to be consistent, right? This means that without any intervening updates, the same query must always return the same results to the same user. So no eventual consistency, right? Durable. This simply means that once data is stored, it's never lost. Some databases don't guarantee that, right? So even if someone unexpectedly yanks the plug from the wall, the data must still be there when the database comes back online. Now, to a user, uh, to many of you, I would, I would imagine, this probably seems like a reasonable list of demands to make up a database, right? Don't lose my data. Let me query and be consistent to anyone on uh, their queries, right? But this is actually hard to do at scale. It, how many people know about NoSQL or, or have heard that term, right? The, the, the big buzz about NoSQL is that uh, they're very scalable, right? You know, horizontally scalable, just throw some Amazon EC2 instances at it and all is well and good. Well, the reason that NoSQL databases typically scale better than relational databases is because they can't, they can't or don't guarantee a lot of the properties that I mentioned before, right? And the reason this is hard to scale is because anything we do to help reads, generally speaking, in a system, penalizes rights. This is true of databases. This is true of systems in general, right? And the reason this is the case is because those requirements, those for reads, are at, odd from, are at odd with the requirements for rights. Here's an illustration of what I mean. So when we talk about being real time, the benefit there is that you can read or do online and ad hoc queries. 
But the write penalty is that you have to uh, use indexing, which means you have to update or write in multiple places, and you, and you incur random disk I.O. Consistency, again, that's great for data integrity on reads, but there's locking involved there, so that penalizes your writes. It also penalizes your reads as well. And then there's the data, the durability or the data reliability issue. And the penalty there is something called F-Sync. Does anyone know what F-Sync means? Okay, a couple of people. I'm not going to give a technical explanation of what F-Sync is, right? It's, it's something you should look up, it's very fascinating. Um, but an, an analogy here is that, let's say, you know, Sean's putting on this conference and you know, he says, hey Jeff, uh, we need candy for the conference. And he said, and he, he wants me to go out and buy some candy. And I say, okay, I'm gonna go grocery shopping later. I'll remember to buy the candy. And he says, no, the candy is the most important part of this conference. I need the candy now. I want you to go to the store right now, get the candy, and send me a picture to prove you bought the candy. That's basically what an F-Sync is with respect to disk writes. Believe it or not, your file system, when you tell it to write stuff to disk, it doesn't actually do it when you think it does. The file system likes to do things in batch, right? When I go grocery shopping, I want to do all my grocery shopping at once. I don't want to go multiple times a day to get multiple items. So that's basically what an f -sync does. And you can imagine, in the context of a database, how that's a penalty. So that is the conventional wisdom. But today, I'm going to discuss four techniques, and I'm going to go through these quickly, uh, that Concourse uses to defy this conventional wisdom. Now, as I said before, these techniques are applicable to systems in general. So you don't have to build a database to get something from this talk. If you're doing any system level programming, hopefully these techniques are applicable to the work you're doing. The first is appending. It turns out that appending to a file is much faster than making in-place updates. Now this is especially true for spinning disks, but it's also relevant for SSDs as well. And what I mean by appending is that we literally just append to the end of the file. We don't do any sorting, no in-place updates. When we want to write new data, we put it at the end, and we move on. Even for deletes, we append. Believe it or not, we write data when we want to delete data. Hmm, imagine that. The reason we do that, again, is because append-only storage is the fastest way to write. So if you delete data, you simply append new data that says, hey, that data from before, it's gone. We combine that with buffering. Now, append-only storage is great for writes, but again, we want to balance fast writes with fast reads, and that's why we must use buffering. In a database, the best way to increase read performance is to do indexing. People, have people been bitten by database bugs where they didn't have an index on something that needed to be indexed and their queries were really slow? Everyone has. So Concourse automatically indexes all of your data for you. You can't, there is no scheme. You don't say index this or index that. It indexes everything, and I mean everything. Now most people that hear that, they're like, whoa, why, why would you do that? You're gonna really slow down your writes. This is where it gets tricky, right? We wanna have fast reads, so we need indexes. Uh, but we also wanna have fast writes. So we use what's called a buffer storage system to take, uh, to take advantage of automatic indexing, but also append-only storage. And this is sort of how that works, right? So, now, here on the, on the right, we have what's called the buffer, and on the left, we have the index data. These are the optimized user data that we care about. This buffer is live. So the way this system works is that when you write, again, you append to the buffer, very simple. When you read, you actually have to look at the appropriate optimized view. So if you're doing the search, you look at the search indexes, if you're doing the query, look at the inverted indices and so forth. And then you have to scan the buffer and reapply all the writes in the buffer to what you got from the optimized views to get the correct query. Now, how does this work with indexing? Well, indexing at the same time happens with reads and writes. So data is what we call transported from this buffer and it's taken to the optimized view store. Here's an example of how that works. So previously we had A on top. Now A is indexed, it's sent to the optimized views. C is on the top of the buffer. Same thing with C, and so forth. That's how this buffered storage system works. Now this can get really tricky, especially because this is a live buffer. As soon as data is in the buffer, even though it's not technically indexed, it must appear to be indexed to the user. It must be queried. But this limits what can happen concurrently. 
We can't read an index at the same time. The reason being is because the indexer and the reader will always overlap. You always read from the top of the buffer, you always index from the top of the buffer. They're always going to overlap, so that just can't happen. But we can read it right at the same time, that's pretty cool. We write to the end of the file, and we start reading from the top of the file. Even if we're in the middle of a read, we have more writes that are appended to this buffer, that's okay because the, the read is never going to surpass the pointer for the end of the, in the, end of the buffer, right? It will just keep reading until the write stop or it happens to be the next write coming in, and it will return. But we can't index and write at the same time. Um, and, and this may be a bit tricky to understand, um, so I'll kind of go through an example. Right, so let's imagine A has been transported. That's the first step of indexing. And then A is removed from the buffer, and the buffer, the data in the buffer is shifted up by moving the head pointer to C, right? But at this point, the right pointer has not been updated. So let's say concurrently, a right is made to where the end of the buffer pointer is. So we've got a right there. And now we update the right pointer. Either we're gonna update the right pointer, maybe the logic says, Whatever the end of the last write was, that's the pointer. Or maybe it's gonna say, hey, this is what I was pointing to before, and get the position of that, and then increment by the size of whatever I just wrote. In that case, we, we lose data or we create a gap. And that's not really good. So how can we get around this? Well, we use something called striping. Striping is another word for segmentation. Um, you know, pad creating different pages uh, breaking the data structure into different segments or pages. This is exactly what we do with the buffer. Instead, instead of having one large buffer, we have a buffer that's made up of several different pages. Now the result of this is that read, reading and indexing at the same time is still not possible. However, we can now write an index at the same time as long as the indexing does not reach the current page that, write, that are receiving writes. So these pages can be indexed no interference with writes. And as long as the indexer doesn't reach this page, they can happen concurrently. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is probability. So, I kind of, you know, went through the buffer storage system, and, and one thing I kind of glossed over was the fact that we have to replay logs, right? We have to replay writes in the buffer. We can't get around that. If we want to have this buffer storage system, that's what we have to do. Well, log replay can be very, very expensive. So, the question here is, is it possible we can skip some pages when scanning the buffer? You, do you all think that's possible to do? Maybe, maybe? Well, the answer is yes, right? But how do we know if we can skip a page in the buffer? Anyone ever um, hear of Bloom filters? Bloom filters are probably uh, my favorite data structure that has ever been created. Bloom filters are, uh, you know, they're probabilistic, they're compact, their size is constant. They don't actually store data. They are just a, a set of bits that represent any data that you want. And so when you add data to a Bloom filter, a number of hash functions are applied, and that determines a set number of bits to flip. When you want to test membership for a piece of data, so you may ask, does this is it possible that this that this Bloom filter contains this data? You apply the same hash functions to that data. And if all the bits are flipped, then you know it might be the case that the data exists. That's why it's probabilistic. It might contain that data. Now, if all the bits aren't flipped, then you know for sure the data doesn't exist. So that's the nice property of clone filters, is that for the, fault, the, the negative case, you have absolute certainty that the data does not exist in the set. It's only in the positive case that you can't be sure. But that can help us though, that can be of a great help. If we can look at a buffer page and say, is it possible that the data that we want to uh, want to query is on this page, is it possible that it exists? If so, we'll look, but if it's not possible, let's just move on and go. And the reason that Bloom filters can't give you a definitive answer about whether data exists or not is because of hash collisions, right? They're a fixed size, you have a certain amount of space you allocate, they're bound to be hash collisions. And so, this is what the buffer storage system looks like uh, Looks like with the Bloom filter. Um, the example here is, let's say we're looking for B. So B exists on the first page. We'll ask our Bloom filter, it'll say, yeah, it's possible B exists on the first page. So we'll replay all those writes. We'll get to the second page, B doesn't exist there. 
hopefully the bloom filter will say, no, Lee is not on this page. And if so, we'll skip right over. Uh, then we get to the third page, same thing, bloom filter says yes, it's possible that Lee exists on this page. We scan that page, we apply the rights, and we're good to go. So in conclusion, this work that we've done in Concourse, what is the, the result of it? I don't actually have any hard perf numbers yet, uh, because that has not been the focus, but in general, compared to a relational database, rights are faster, and queries are comparable, even though we index everything. And so, Concourse, as I said, is open source. If you're interested in learning more, or even contributing, the website is concoursedb.com, where you can always email me and ask me questions. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I've got like 20 seconds, of, is there a question or something? Uh, if not, I'm happy to talk with people after the next couple of talks. Thank you.